Angela Brownridge was just two when she first climbed up onto the piano stool at home. At the age of seven, she appeared in public for the first time. She played a concerto at the age of 10. And by that time, she'd already had several of her own compositions published. So she wasn't exactly a slow starter. Well, Angela's now given concerts all around the world, made many broadcasts and lots of recordings. She's not somebody to play safe as a performer. She likes to communicate, to take risks, to use lots of colour in her playing. And she hates the idea that concert pianists occupy some ivory tower. Well, prepare to be entertained as Angela brings you a selection of her favourite piano music. Music by Mozart, Beethoven, Chopin, Liszt and Debussy. She'll also be doing something she's been brilliant at since she was a child, improvising. She'll be playing her own arrangements of two Gershwin standards right here in the studio. somebody once decided that would be called the win to win but in fact it's a study an etude the opus 25 number 11 uh, study implies that it's teaching pianists to play in a certain way mm. uh, and this is a particularly difficult one isn't it yes i mean i think of all the chopin studies this is the most difficult so definitely. what exactly is so tricky to play well first of all it's the right hand figuration which is really unique i've never come across anything like it in piano playing and it's also 
the strength with which you're expected to play this over a very, very long period of time. So you say figuration. Now, yes. what does that exactly mean? Now, it means that in the right hand, you have what we call a chromatic scale, where every <laughs> note... So all the black notes, all, all the white the black notes. notes. The right hand plays... <laughs> ..that at the top. And underneath, there are chords. But the chords are split up. Which and you're playing about a third speed at the moment. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And you've got to do this, as I say, with tremendous strength from the beginning, because Chopin has written the word risoluto, which means determined, forte, the Italian dynamic level, which means loud. So you're given these instructions. And as I say, the piece goes on for eight pages. Now, there are other things. There is the black key study, which also has this kind of seesaw movement. Yes. But that's not half as difficult as the other one. And also, it's very, very light. Now, when your fingers play in a line, as the last study, that is not so difficult. But, but this positioning of your hand, your hand is actually at a sideways angle also. Ideally, we play with our hands straight, but you can't unless you are sort of leaning right like It's not possible. So we've got all of these terrible difficulties in this one piece. But in what sense is it a student exercise and how much is it actually really a concert piece? It sounds to me as if only a, an outstanding pianist can actually mm. play this in concert. Well, it really requires complete independence of fingers. That may sound simple in itself, but it isn't. This is something that we strive to do from very, very early days of learning the piano. And, I mean, it is a fantastic concert study. But if you play all the Opus 25 studies from 1 to 12 as a concert item, which would take up a whole half of a concert, then there is another terrible, terrible obstacle to be overcome in that the preceding study is octaves which goes on for ages, it's pounding, it's fierce, and your muscles are left absolutely burning at the end of it. Then you've got this winter wind study that goes on for ages and ages, and then the very last piece is that one that I demonstrated, the C minor, these tumultuous rushing chords up and down, which go on again for a very, very long time. And all of this put together, you'd think that Chopin was trying to torture us, but if you can do that, then perhaps you can say, well, I've just about reached the height of pianism and be very proud of yourself, I suppose. Well, what does it say about Chopin the pianist? Well, I don't think it matters whether he could play these things or whether he couldn't. He certainly had students who did. And there was one student that was playing, I think, one of the ballads. It doesn't really matter that he wasn't playing one of these studies. But he did give it a very sort of fearsome approach. And Chopin said, my son, you play like a tiger. He said, if I could play like that, that is what I would do. So I think it's what went on in his mind, really, rather more than what he could actually do on the keyboard that matters. It's an interesting case, though, Chopin, that he, I think in his life, he only played something like 35, 40 right. concerts. Yes, that, I, I yes. mean, he certainly yeah. was an outstanding yeah. pianist. Yeah. Um, why no more than that? Well, first of all, he was used to playing in salons. Um, he started, really, when he was about 16 in Warsaw. He played in, in the homes of the rich and the aristocratic. He was also a very refined individual, a very sensitive man, who played in a very sensitive way. He used the soft pedal a lot, which could, you know, even with those early pianos, gain a certain effect. And his kind of playing, perhaps, was not suited to audiences who came to hear Liszt and his great rival Talberg. Now, these two were absolute giants of the pianistic world. They became so very, very quickly, and audiences absolutely adored them, to the extent that they were so close in, in their abilities to play, I mean, very, very brilliant virtuoso music, that they had a competition, and Liszt won. And it was that sort of level of virtuosity that the audiences just loved. They lapped it up. And if you'd put Chopin into that context, he wouldn't have gone down very well. It's a shame. I mean, that maybe is just ignorance on the part of audiences of those days. But also, at that time, when he was in Paris, Chopin was earning a lot of money from teaching. And also, he was patronised by the Rothschild family. He didn't need to play because he had enough money to live on. And he had a very, very good social life. He was very satisfied with that. And I think also, I mean, the amount of composing that he did, 
the in intensity of this music as well would take a lot out of him. And so there's this need to become a top virtuoso was just never there. It was something in his personality. Well, we'll return to Chopin mm. uh, a bit later on in, in your recital. I mean, we'll move on now to another great virtuoso, uh, Beethoven, wonderful player, mm. even played when he went deaf, yes, you know, yes. such yeah. was the, the compulsion mm. uh, to play on the concert platform. I mean, move to a very interesting period of his compositional life with the Appassionata Sonata. I mean, give us the context here. What's what's changing in, in his in his life, in his in his uh, composition at this time? This mm. is the early part of the 19th century. Yes, yes. Well, first of all, as I say, he was given an Erard piano in 1804. He was presented with it. And this piano was a very, very significant advance on what had gone before. The piano that he'd had before, it had far much more power, it was bigger, it was longer, the sustaining pedal was also a lot better. And I think he became so excited by this piano that it really gave him a lot more sort of thoughts about the sound that it could make. And it's very significant that the Waldstein Sonata starts right down in the bass. With that mysterious, even though it's in the major. And so does the Appassionata down here. This mysterious opening. And he utilised that part of the piano much more, as well as the top because it had more power. And I think that he was just so inspired by this piano that he rose to new heights of passion and drama. But in, in what way can we imagine that it freed the inner Beethoven? It's one thing saying he's got a piano that's got more mm. at the top, more at the bottom. Mm. But what about what's going on inside Beethoven himself? I mean, the power and passion that's in these works, and it's not least the Appassionata, mm. given, it, given its title, suggests that you know, it's far more something that's personal than merely technical. Yes, well, I mean, the onset of deafness had started, and I think that that must have been quite significant. I mean, it's a, the most terrible thing to happen to anybody, particularly of his power, um, of compositional power, and also, as I say, the world that surrounded him with wars and that kind of thing. Because we're right slap bang in the, in the middle of yes. the, the mm -hmm. French Revolutionary mm -hmm. Napoleonic Wars mm -hmm. period, and we know that Beethoven took an interest in the music that was coming out of Paris, the music that was played on the streets by bands, yes. and we, we hear that in the symphonies, mm -hmm. and one can imagine that it equally comes through in the keyboard music oh, yes, in a way. Oh yes, very much so. I mean, it's, it's very, such drama. Yes, and also of very, very symphonic proportions as well. I mean, the huge chords of the opening of the Appassionata. like a full orchestra. They're, they're just amazing. And I mean, he'd never written anything like that before. Also, I mean, he had had love affairs that had come to nothing. Unfortunately, his emotional life had not been successful at all. And I think that this drives a person inwardly to sort of greater heights. I mean, the frustration that he must have felt, a woman that he wanted to marry who just didn't want him. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of things combined. I mean, that sounds like a very romantic I idea mm. in various senses of the, of the word, but I mean, composers do just write out of what's inside them. Of I mean, course they do, pop, yes. pop stars do the same yeah, thing. Exactly. I mean, that's a perfectly yes. natural it thing. It is, yes, 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 definitely. Well, let's hear the first movement of Beethoven's mm -hmm. Appassionata Sonata, Angela. <laughs>
Angela, did you come from a musical family? Is that where it all comes from? There was music dotted around all over the place. My mother was an infant school teacher and she played for school, the music and movement kind of thing for these little ones. She played everything in the key of E flat major. I mean, if she read something from music, it was automatically transferred, which is quite amazing. My father, even though he worked in a bank, I'm sure he had perfect pitch. He never learnt to read a note of music. But everything that I was playing at the time, he used to whistle. And he always whistled it in the right key. So perfect pitch is the ability to know exactly what note yes, yes, you're... Yes, and you hear it in your head. Mm. And also, I had a very musical cousin called Geoffrey Heald Smith, who was miles older than me. When I was a kid, he was at the Royal College of Music, studying piano and cello. And so he used to come through with his parents every so often. And he was really the greatest sort of influence that I had. He used to play classical pieces and he also played jazz, which was wonderful. And he was a very, very great inspiration to me. I mean, he was the model. He was what I wanted to be. And as I say, my mother had a, you know, her father was a, a wonderful musician who actually orchestrated things and was a conductor. Had no musical lessons at all ever in his life. And so it goes on. There are people, other people as well, that could just sit down and play and do things. But none of them ever took it up professionally. So there was a piano in the house yes. at mm -hmm. home. Uh, can you remember the first time you played? Well, I can remember. I mean, my mother did tell me, of course, this story went on and was told many, many times that when I was two and was attempting to sort of walk, I mean, as a child does, to pull itself up on furniture, I pulled myself up on the piano stool, managed to get onto it and stayed there. And they had a job to get me off. And, you know, I was just playing little notes like that rather than things that kids do like that. And every single day from then on, I was always wanting to get onto this piano stool and just listen to things that my little fingers found. So you've composed in your life. You, mm. you had pieces published before you were even, even 10. Yeah. Do you think your interest in, in composition actually goes right back to those initial moments when you dotted notes on the piano? Oh yes, definitely. I mean, by the time I was three, my mother wanted desperately to get back to school, get back to work. She taught me to read and write, and so she sent me to school myself, even though I was really quite a lot younger than other children. And I was always saying, I want piano lessons, Mum, I want piano lessons. And there was one very, very good teacher in this small town where I was born, Dr Ramsey, who lived just round the corner. So my mother went to see him and she said, my child is desperate to learn. And he said, I don't take anybody under the age of six. They have to be able to read and write. And so my mother said, oh, but she can. I've taught her to read and write. And he said, well, I'm very sorry, but I can't take her until she's six. And so on my sixth birthday, I went around, knocked at the door and said, I'm here. And what I took him was some little pieces that I'd composed because tunes came into my head and usually if they were any good, they stayed there. And I hadn't learned to read music by that time, but I could pick them out on the piano. And so I took those to him and I think he was probably a little bit surprised. Here's a challenge. Can you remember any of your earliest compositions? Yeah. It's a very, very great shame, really, that we had a huge sort of scrapbook with these things written very, very carefully in my mother's hand. My piano teacher used to write down the compositions. I used to take them to him every week. And part of this precious half hour that I had with him, it was never more than half an hour, was spent writing down these pieces. And then my mother would transfer them into this book, which got lost during a house move. So apart from these two published pieces, which are called Gloomy Water and Soldier's March, there is nothing at all. I do remember that Gloomy Water was a piece written in fourths, that's an interval, four notes apart, that rather fascinated me. And as far as I can remember, it went something like this. Little figure that then repeated, and it would have then gone on to another section. Possibly, I think it was all in the minor key. And that was published? Yes, it was, yes. As Where was that? That was as a result of a competition that was run by Steve Race for a programme called Whirligig on Saturday afternoons. We didn't have a television at the time, so we used to go around to my best friend Pauline, and always on Saturday afternoon we were together playing. And then one day this programme came on, and Steve Race said, I am starting a comp competition for children. Please send in your composition. So wham, mine went straight in. We watched the TV avidly next week, winner Angela Brownridge. So 
The week after that, I sent in another composition. And every single week, my compositions won the first prize. Until, in the end, people began sending letters to Steve Ray saying, we've had enough of this, it's not fair. My little Enid's written something very good and she doesn't get a chance. And so Steve Race had to phone my mother and say, look, enough is enough. But he did do me the, the sort of honour of putting these pieces in the Whirligig Annual. Well, so sad that those early compositions oh, were lost. I'm but if it's any consolation, I think a similar sort of thing happened to a lot of Mozart's piano sonatas. <laughs> it's, it's thought that, he, of course, he improvised quite a lot mm. when he was, he was performing his own sonatas. Yes. And mm. those that weren't written down or, mm. or saved mm. in some sort of way are, are lost. Yes. Yeah. Thankfully, we can move on to... Uh, the slow movement of a Mozart sonata mm -hmm. that that mm -hmm. has survived. Oh yes, this yes. is the K three 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 sonata. Um, you played the Winter Wind uh, previously, uh, which we know wasn't the title that Chopin gave mm. to it. Do you think that uh, pieces like this would actually become better known if they did have titles instead of one having to mouth K three three three? Or, or Opus twenty five number eleven. Yes, well, I think it's very very difficult because. This particular sonata is beautiful. I mean, it starts. I mean, what would you call that? Happiness on a summer's day. Um, I don't know, it would be very, very difficult. I mean, there's something so striking about the winter wind that it almost demands a title, just like the Appassionata does. But I don't think we could call Mozart anything. I think just the fact that it's Mozart is enough. Now, you played Mozart when you were a child? Yes, I did, yes. I mean, the first sonata that I played was the very, very well-known C major. along with tens of thousands of other children. Exactly. Of course, uh, the pianist Arthur Schnabel is supposed to have said something like, um, grown-ups give uh, their children Mozart to play because of the small quantity of the notes. Uh, grown-ups are frightened of Mozart because of the sheer quality yes, of the exactly. notes. Yeah. And that's so often mm. quoted, that mm. it must have a grain mm. of truth in it. Um, in what way does the piece you're about to play perhaps demonstrate that? The great simplicity about mm. it and yet that doesn't mean it's easy to play. No, it doesn't. Um, with Mozart, we find that the ideas in the phrasing, the emotions in the phrasing, vary tremendously. We can go from one feeling to another very, very quickly. And therefore, these phrases sort of have a life of their own. One moves on to the next. And also, those have to be controlled. They come to an end, another one starts, and you're constantly showing yourself, the audience, that this is happening. And also, he was such a wonderful imitator of the human voice that this slow movement starts like a beautiful duet for sopranos. There's that little element of doubt that enters. And you're going through these scenarios all the time. It's life music, is this. It's human emotion. And opera is never far mm. away as far and as And therefore, you've got to be able, obviously, to give it this singing quality as well, which isn't necessarily easy. Well, let's hear it. Thanks very much, Angela.
move on to Debussy, a bit of a jump, but we stay in your childhood, Angela, the first time that you really came across Debussy. Yes, I was actually 15 at the time, and I'd gone to a wonderful teacher in London called Dorothy Hess, whom I always called Hesse. And one day, one Saturday morning, when I travelled from the Midlands to study with her, she played this piece, Roughly Dans L'eau, and it made such an impression on me. I was absolutely staggered. And that really was the first time you'd heard Debussy? Not really. I'd actually played Claire de Lune by ear and had the temerity to play it in concerts as well. But it's not quite on the same level musically. Claire de Lune is a very beautiful piece and it's one of Debussy's most popular pieces and it is still an image, but the images that were created in Reflections in the Water were something quite different, harmonies that I'd never really heard before in the piece and also the touch, the very lightness of it. A lot of this piece is very soft and it ranges again from the bottom to the top of the piano. It also has immense brilliance in it, which we wonder if that is actually connected with water or whether it's just a compositional ploy that obviously he had to, you know, use to keep the music interesting. But as I say, when Dorothy Hess played this piece, she was a fantastic woman. She used to grunt and growl when she played and this all sort of added intensity to it. So when she started, you know, sort of murmuring underneath and she said herself, you know, this is the most wonderful piece. You imagine so much in your mind. And of course, I did immediately. I just couldn't, I was blown away completely by it. And then something happened on your way home <laughs> yes. or at the end of your lesson. Yes, it did. I'm afraid uh, I used to wear fantastically high stiletto heels. Um, I used to really tart myself up for going down to London for these lessons. And at the top of the stairs, she had very, very steep stairs going up to this flat in Bayswater where she had two grand pianos in a lovely studio. And I caught my heel in the top step and fell in a sort of rather undignified but not terribly dangerous manner downstairs. I was actually going to open the door for the next pupils. There was a whole family on the doorstep and the door actually had glass in it so they could see this figure sort of falling down the stairs and they must have wondered what in the world was happening. And I was in such a daze that I actually got on the wrong train. I went the wrong way on the circle line. So I had to go all the way round. I just went all the way round. So Debussy is responsible for you falling down the stairs oh, in a way? absolutely. It is. Yes, Interesting. Yes, so yes. what are these sounds? I mean, show us, what are these sounds that so captivate you? I'm, I'm intrigued mm. that, you know, with very little experience of, of Debussy, mm. something new comes along like that, so different, yes. and yet it's captivating immediately mm. to you. Yes. These are what I think of as very dark sounds. This water that he's describing to my mind, I mean, he never wrote anything about it. He never said it is this or it is that. In fact, he just called this composition an intimate conversation with myself. So he was using his own imagination and we are therefore expected to use ours as well. And it's the darkness of these chords that resemble to me a pool that is very, very still, maybe in the middle of a wood, something like that. And the actual reflections or ripples are caused by little droplets. And when it opens, you can feel these droplets and the movement, the circular movement of the ripples. Also, there is a passage very near the beginning. Again, that, that, that kind of sound. What makes it sound so different? Well, what, what are the techniques that he's using to make it sound so different? In this instance, the music is what you could call tonal. It's based in a key, D flat major. We're still in D flat major there. But what he's doing is using fourths, interval of a fourth, and a fifth underneath all the way down, almost like Chinese music, which at that time was something new. And Debussy was a man with a mission because he wanted to create something that was entirely new in music. He had studied at the Paris Conservatoire and he said, why should we revere music just because it's old? 
all students had to be writing their Bach inventions and fugues and things like that as exercises. And when he said this, he said, in the poetry that we see today, Baudelaire, Verlaine, Mallarmé, there is a freedom, there's a fantasy. Why shouldn't we have it in music? And so what he was doing, he was searching for a new language, which I think even though he'd written quite a number of small pieces before this, and the sweet Bergamasque, out of which we get Claire de Lune, this is the first piece which arrives at that point that he'd actually found something completely different. And what he's doing is he uses chords that have no relation to anything that went before. They're, com they're free. If he thought of writing whatever, he could do that. He thought, why not? Freedom. This is the name of the game. And that's what brought about this wonderful imagery, the fact that he was not really tied to conventional harmony anymore. But it's not precise imagery. I mean, should we compare him with Impressionist painters in that the, mm. that the lines that are drawn mm. by Impressionist painters are not exact lines? Exactly. We, we are left yeah. to make up our minds that's about right. what exactly is going on. Yes. Do we know whether he was inspired by Impressionist painters as well? I think he must have been. He must have been. Because the whole movement of Impressionism, both in art, literature and music, sort of came together, searching for this new, you know, sort of formula. And as I said, there are instances when, you know, he uses something different, that little figure that I played. He then takes it on into a passage that continues like a cadenza. And it is still quite watery, but it's very, very, very brilliant. And that's quite amazing because Debussy, unlike the other people that we've been talking about, the other composers, all of them, Chopin, Beethoven, Mozart, Debussy was not a performing prodigy. He found playing the piano quite difficult. And again, he could not really perform his compositions to any sort of standard. And it's just amazing that he's produced music which is so beautiful to play. It lies under your fingers fantastically. And there was a time, I think, when he was coaching the pianist Marguerite Long, and he used to stand with his hands on her shoulders, squeezing her, so she could get just the right sort of touch on the piano, whether it was incredibly delicate or a little bit stronger or whatever. And this is what you've got to do to make the colour in Debussy's music as well. So touch is everything. It is, it is, absolutely, yes. OK, Reflections in the Water mm -hmm. by Debussy. Thank you.
I just love the way Debussy takes you to places in the mind where you've never been to mm. before in music. I don't know what it is. It sort of it frees your own mind. He mm. wanted his music to be free, and it frees one's own mind. Well, look, I was very intrigued, Angela, by the fact that you chose not to go to a conservatoire. You choose, chose to actually go to university, to Edinburgh University. Now, why was that? Did you want something that was more rounded as an education? You didn't just want to play the piano? No, I didn't choose to go there at all, in ah. actual fact. It was very, very strange circumstance that led me there because I wanted to get a scholarship either to the Royal College or the Royal Academy of Music. Uh, my father was never keen on me having a, a career as a pianist. Oh, why was that? Um, he thought that there wasn't too much money to be made. I mean, he was a banker and he was a, a man who thought hard about earning pennies in life. And also, I think, I mean, so terribly mistakenly, he imagined that I would just get married and have children and forget it all, you know, which was so far from the truth. It was unbelievable. And he'd often said, well, I'm not going to give you any money for your career. You know, if you want to do it, you'll have to find it yourself. And so obviously the plan to get a scholarship was uppermost in my mind. And I was at Loughborough Girls High School and some information about a piano scholarship to Edinburgh University came to the school. And the music mistress said, well, why don't you have a go at it? Give you some experience, even though there's a lot of academic work involved. And I had to take this scholarship in January, which was way before the time I would have taken a scholarship for any place in London or any of the other conservatoires in the country. And to my amazement, I got this scholarship. It depended on, we had to do six hours of academic work, I mean, to have exams in that one day and then give an hour's recital. And I think out of the entire country, six of us had been chosen. And I was the last one to go in the afternoon. When I finished my recital, which also included the Debussy. Did it? Huh? Yes, it did. Um, I was sitting in front of all these professors and it was Kenneth Layton, who was a professor there, who actually said, well, Miss Brownridge, we're going to award you the scholarship. And I was never more amazed in my whole life. It was for the first time that I just didn't really expect to get it because I thought, well, you know, this sort of thing isn't for me. Well, what did your father say then? Oh, well, all right, then if you're going there, that, that's it then, isn't it? You know, um, I suppose he may have been pleased that some sort of decision had been made and I did have the money and I could go. Um, but it made me think very, very hard about whether I wanted to take this option. It was very, very risky to wait for the scholarships to these other places in case I didn't get them. And I did take advice from Dorothy Hess, who unfortunately was very ill and near to death at the time. And the last conversation I had with her was, Angela, do it, take it. It will improve your mind, it will open your mind. And I did have pianistic duties as well as a lot of academic work, and I had the most marvellous time. And I, I don't regret it. It did set me back very slightly from starting my career, but I think it was one of the best moves that I ever made. And the contact with Kenneth Leighton yes. mm -hmm. uh, went beyond that initial mm -hmm. uh, awarding of the, of the scholarship. Yes, yes. You worked with him on a regular basis, mm -hmm. and it's his music, in fact, we're going to hear next. Yes, that's right. We were a very, very small faculty. There were only 18 students in my year, and we were divided into groups of four. And we had these tutorials every week, and luckily I had Kenneth for harmony composition and counterpoint. Now that meant three hours a week with this poor man, four of us. And he was just a wonderful inspirational teacher who was completely hooked on Bach. But he managed to make all our lessons so interesting. And he was also a fantastic piano player. He did play some of his compositions to us students. Um, and you know, they were very, very difficult pieces. So. I really got to know him an awful lot better, I think, after I left Edinburgh. Well, uh, the accounts I've read of him as a pianist suggest he was something remarkable. Mm. Why didn't he have a career? Well, when he went to Queen's College in Oxford, and he actually took a degree in classics. And whilst he was there, he suddenly decided that he might take a degree in music as well. And so he got a Bachelor of Music degree, these two degrees. And also, when he was 17, he'd begun composing. He'd actually had two pieces published by then. He was writing orchestral music while he was a student at Queen's. And obviously, this composing career had started. And while he was in Oxford, he had lessons from somebody called Claude Pollard, who gave him what Kenneth described as a virtuoso technique. But he said, I, I never wanted a performing life. He said, I can't be bothered with all that traveling around and mm. learning immense numbers of pieces and having to vary it. He was just a superb pianist, but he just decided that he wanted an academic life and composition. Well, he's known to perhaps cathedral choirs mm. for the amount of mm. uh, choral music that, that he wrote. 
other things, not quite so well known. He's not a name that's on everybody's lips, no, Kenneth that's Layton. That's true, yes. Uh, but the work you're going to play to us, you've played often in concerts. Mm. And mm. I gather that people always comment on it. Yes. It's called Study Number Four, which is not a very promising no. <laughs> title mm. for a piece. No. Um, I find a very sort of melancholy flavour mm. in there, mm. um, but it's more complex just than that, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's a melody that is decorated a lot. I mean, it starts quite simply, but it increases in the amount of decoration it's given. And also, Kenneth had a fondness for involving another part, a little sort of counterpart down in the bass, which makes comments and sort of has a little life of its own as well. And it's very much, in a way, like the Italian concerto of Bach, the second movement, that were this delicious... <laughs> that same sort of flavour of melancholy about it. As you say, it. he loved his yes, Bach. he did. And also, the Barbara Adagio has this same feeling about it as well. Um, and so, the music obviously progresses in its middle section. It turns into something completely different. It begins to be more intense and agitated and works up to a huge climax, which was again typical of Kenneth. He was capable of writing something in a very meditative mood, which would suddenly start moving forward and building up to something enormous, full of passion and fire. Well, I mean, that asks the question. Um, there's the flavour of melancholy, there's a feeling of a lament, there's mm. all that deep passion. Mm. You have the chance to actually meet this composer. Mm -hmm unlike Mozart or Beethoven, yes, yes. does the music fit the person that you knew? No, not at all. Well, that's strange, isn't it? It is. It's very strange. I mean, Kenneth came from Wakefield. He was born into a very, very humble family. They lived in a little terrace house near the gasworks. And they must have found it extraordinary that the boy, they had two sons. There was an elder boy called Donald, who also played jazz. He was a very good jazz pianist. But Kenneth was a pianist from the beginning. He got his LREM diploma when he was 17, and he had lessons from, I think, the wife of the geography teacher in the Queen Elizabeth Grammar School that he attended. And he was a very humble person. He was very modest. He never put himself about. I mean, he was never like a lot of composers, sending out his compositions to pianists and saying, would you play them? I mean, I receive things quite regularly with letters saying, you know, we would love you to perform this or whatever. Kenneth wasn't like that. Um, I mean, obviously there was an inner fire, which I think is really just a facet of genius. I think that it exists in people. Even if it's submerged, it actually comes out in, in the music. Well, let's hear Kenneth Layton's study number four.
I found that absolutely captivating mm. and a work of, of real craftsmanship. Mm. It's somebody who really understands the piano inside out. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Well, you had a tough time then in organising your uh, musical education uh, at university. I mean, how do you think things are now for women, women pianists? Mm. I mean, are, are there as many female students as there are male now? Yes, definitely. I think things have just got better and better and better, perhaps over the past 50 or so years. And it is true that obviously women in the past, in the 1800s particularly, were not suited to a, a concert career. There were very, very few of them. I mean, Clara Schumann, wife of Robert Schumann, the composer, was one who did tour extensively um, because she was really driven by her father. Um, and she worked very, very hard, bless her. But there were not very many women around at all, either as performers or composers. But gradually, obviously, life has changed for us. And a lot of things have happened in history to make us sort of more equal with men, shall I say. Um, so there are lots and lots of female players around today. In fact, when I go to give master classes, which I, I do at some of the colleges, I found that often there is a preponderance of girls. And it's not because the boys don't want to participate or they're shy or anything like that. It's just that there are a lot of females around. I know it's a simplistic question in a way, but do, by and large, women play differently to men? Well, the things that are equal, let's say, first of all, are the fact that we can play with the same power of men. Some people will find that strange. Mm. Yes, I mean, absolutely. I was sitting next to a very, very well-known accompanist at a BBC dinner about 10 years ago, and he said, oh, Angela, what are you doing next with your concerts? And I said, I'm playing Brahms' second piano concerto. And he said, what? A woman playing Brahms' second piano concerto? Because this is one of the biggest concertos. It's one of the longest and also heaviest to play, to do with strength um, and that sort of thing. And I thought, oh, for goodness sake, you know, we are in the 20th century as we were then. OK, well, how do you play with the same weight as a man in a work like that, with all those great big chords mm. and what have you? Well, what is, is it technically that you have to actually acquire? It's really quite simple. I mean, there are two things. Obviously, you need to see the necessity in the music, perhaps to play as big as you possibly can. And then you've got to have, as you said, the technique to do it. Now, my teacher, Maria Corcio, was a tiny little woman. She was quite bird-like. And one of the first demonstrations she gave to me was something that was really quite powerful. And she said, darling, it doesn't matter. She was Italian. She always had this accent. She said, whether you are tiny, whether you weigh 20 stone or whatever, it doesn't matter. You've got to know how to do it. And so she taught me how to produce massive tone that was still beautiful. It must never be harsh, never be horrible. So presumably it's far more than what happens with the oh, fingers yes, and yeah. forearms. It's mm. using the whole of your upper body. Yes, and I mean, it's not only the upper body, you start with your bottom. And in a way, I suppose that's a, 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 a means by which you protect your fingers and, and forearms, because if all the pressure of making all that power is going into that area of your mm. body, you know, it's down the doctors within a couple of weeks. Yes, it's because of the tension that you would have to create in order to make that sound. And a lot of musicians, of course, do suffer from physical mm. injury. You know, this wonderful world of classical music, you mm. wouldn't think this would be the case, but there are hundreds and hundreds of musicians every year who suffer all sorts of things uh, as a result of playing classical music. It's yes. extraordinary, really, like sportsmen. Mm. Yes. OK, but what about poetry in their playing or general interpretation? Do female pianists have more than male pianists? I know one can't be categorical about mm. it. Well, I think, first of all, there is a real difference in teenagers. When you teach teenage girls and teenage boys, the girls actually respond emotionally very much better and at an earlier stage of their lives than boys do. Boys are a bit backwards. They're out after the brilliance, the showmanship, that kind of thing. But girls can find inner feelings of poetry. And I think it's just true that girls develop a little bit quicker in that respect. But I do think that when we grow up, there isn't a huge amount of difference because even in composers who have really always been male, there is a great deal of tenderness, all the feelings that we women think we possess just because we become mothers and we look after people and we have these wonderful maternal feelings that men can never share because they don't do it. But I think that when it gets to the area of music, it somehow equals out. I mean, we would like to think that perhaps females have something extra, but I think really at the end of the day, it's possibly not true. 
Well, that's a pretty good cue to the pieces you're playing next. A composer who produced music of great, great tenderness. Mm. Uh, this mm. is Franz Liszt. Yes. And he wrote vast amounts of piano music mm. and devoted a lot of attention to transcribing other composers' songs. And that's sort of where we go next. Two songs, but his own songs yes, that he's turned into songs. piano pieces. That's right, yes. Now, what's the attraction of... Uh, writing transcriptions like this? Is, is it what the, the market demanded? Did people love to hear the songs of the moment turned into piano pieces? I don't know. I think that perhaps Liszt was inspired by the poetry and having once turned them into a song, and I've actually heard both of these pieces sung in, on the concert platform, and they're far, far less interesting, less passionate than the piano versions. I think that he realised he'd got two winners on his hands with the melodies, and what could be done with the piano, which was significantly more. Because, I mean, the, the opening melody of the Liebestraum, number three, again, is one of the most famous things in the world. <laughs> So when you hear that with a human voice, and there's just a somehow to me doesn't have the same appeal, I'm afraid. That's right. And the second piece, the second song, reflects the fact that uh, Liszt was perhaps the first great travelling piano virtuoso going all over Europe uh, to make his living. And he wrote a, a series of sets of pieces mm -hmm. that carry that sort of implication, years of pilgrimage. Mm. That's the way he described it. Yes. Uh, so the, this particular piece you're going to play from the, the years of pilgrimage is what? It's the Petrarch sonnet number 104, 104. Now Petrarch was a, a poet who lived in the 1300s. He was born in 1303. And so he's writing in very, very archaic Italian. But nevertheless, it's still a very beautiful language. And the poem that this piece is based on, because when Liszt wrote this set of years of pilgrimage, it was book two, which was Italy. He took his inspiration from pictures, poetry, literature, Dante's Inferno, that sort of thing, rather than the Swiss journeys, which looked at the mountains and the streams and thunderstorms and more visual things like that. And so he based this piece on this very, very passionate love poem, which is full of the most extreme contrasts. It starts by saying, I find no peace, yet I am not at war. I despair, I hope, I burn, but I'm made of ice. I fly above the heavens, but I'm rooted in earth. And it just goes on like this. And the very, very last line says, and all of this, my lady, because of you. So it, it is a very, very passionate piece altogether. I mean, it starts out... So in that opening, you've got immediately huge contrast. And so the piece goes on, a beautiful, sumptuous melody which is just so gorgeous. In fact, I mean, it is one of the most ravishing pieces, I think, that Liszt ever wrote. I mean, the word ravishing really describes it. The climaxes are enormous, the amount of brilliance that goes on as well. It's really a very, very successful work altogether. Two songs for piano yes. by Franz yes. Liszt. Yes.
There's so much wonderful Liszt piano music. He wrote reams and reams and reams of the stuff, but relatively a small proportion is performed. I mean, is, is that because there's almost too much for people to take in and analyse, or what? Well, the difficulty is extreme. The difficulty is extreme. Even in a piece like the Petrarch sonnet, we have these huge swathes of arpeggios, that's chords, that go up the piano like that and come down very, very brilliantly. It's not just a matter of playing the fabulous tune, but there's all this kind of stuff interpolated as well. Um, there is, in the previous piece that I played, the Liebestraum number three, some really fiendish passages that Liszt wrote, I think, as a vehicle for his own virtuosity, even if it was extremely light, what we call perle, like pearls of notes just cascading down. I think that is one of the, the reasons. It really is very, very tough stuff. And We're used to the idea that there are so many young pianists out there these days with amazing techniques. Mm, mm. Um, I mean, surely they should be exploring this mm. much more than they do. Yes, but the thing is, it's very, very funny that I've found, again, giving master classes and judging competitions, they may choose the most ferocious list pieces, but they're very poor on subtlety. And I've had to take quite a number of them apart and say, look, it's not all loud and thunderous, my dear. It's not. There is another world. You want to really look at the score and see what Liszt wrote because he was very, very good at putting all the instructions down. And I think that we've got used to the fact that, you know, people do choose a lot of these blood and thunder pieces for the, the purposes of compositions and what have you. And that's not always the greatest Liszt, even though it may be the most difficult. OK, we've been in the world of Liszt, the songwriter, and of course Chopin, we return to Chopin, mm. to another study, um, a brilliant writer of melodies mm. for the piano, which suggests the atmosphere of the times uh, was such that music from opera, song, mm. fed into his music. Would yes. that be correct? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it was a great thing that happened in, in musical history, the change from classical music to romantic music. And really at the heart of this change was melody. I mean, Chopin was a wonderful writer of melodies, and also he was really one of the first to exploit a melody as a single line that we get, I mean, obviously in the nocturnes. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful thing, with an accompaniment underneath. And this single line prevails, again, just like a, a human voice. And also the interest in opera became much, much greater in the Romantic era. And of course, the operatic voice is spread over a wider range. And we find that Chopin is also writing melodies that really scale the heights, these intervals. I mean, sometimes more than that. There is, I mean, the D-flat nocturne as well, which is absolutely gorgeous, that sort of goes right up an octave, and the expressing of these intervals is something very... It is like the human voice, that you need to almost sort of take a breath. Um, this... As you reach the top, you know, you feel it's like a voice, and... This was really, you know, sort of one of the quintessential things of the Romantic era. You use the term Romantic era. Mm. It's associated with composers feeling much more free to express mm. their feelings about all sorts of things uh, in life, in their music. So why should the melody be a good vehicle for that exactly? What is it about that simple idea of a melody? Because you might say, well, let's have lo lots and lots more colour mm. from the mm. rapidly mm. developing mm. piano. Why the melody? Yes. Because I think that the melody again, represents poetry and emotion, that it's, it's straight there in your face, if you like. You can feel it immediately. And because the melody stood alone, it was not like, say, Beethoven, even in the beautiful Pathétique. Where the melody isn't actually singing right on top, it's got its accompaniment very, very close. But with Chopin, a lot of the melody is right up there like, like a solo. And it does, it, it can represent emotion absolutely wonderfully. 
as we find in this C-sharp minor study, which is something completely different. So I suppose we've also got public concerts developing, the idea that musicians have to sell their music to a paying public in the mm. way that wasn't the case before. And I suppose, in a way, the most immediate way of getting across your musical message is in a melody form, I oh, suppose. Oh, yes, absolutely, mm. yes. OK, well, let's hear the Chopin mm. Opus 25, number 7 study. So you described for us earlier what the study nature of the winter wind etude was. What is there to learn as a student from that study, the Opus 25, number 7 study, technically? One of the most 
important things in piano playing and one of the things that's certainly dearest to my heart and that is the singing style which is called an Italian bel canto which means beautiful song and of course in this study we have the left hand playing most of this melody with a beautiful little comment from the right hand on top. Sometimes the right hand has its own little bits of melody but mostly it's the left hand um, which again is, is sort of like a cello melody and we have to learn to sing at the piano. We'll return to Chopin in just a moment, but to, let's put you on the spot now, Angela. The things that you most dislike about being a concert pianist, what are the things that you really have to put up with week in, week out? Criticism is one thing. From whom? Anybody, the press, even one's friends, one's husband. My husband is a very knowledgeable man and he's always been very, very critical of me. Um, but in, in a good way, obviously, because it's, it's got to help. I've got to listen to him because I do trust him in actual fact. But to read in the press something that somebody has written, you think, oh, goodness, I didn't really deserve that at all. It can be very, very cruel. Um, I mean, apart from that, there really isn't an awful lot. The travelling can get very, very boring, particularly on long-haul flights and places that one visits frequently, which were once very, very exciting to go to, have now ceased to be so. And there are lots of times when it is a very, very lonely existence. Um, after a concert, perhaps, when you're high and if you've had a particularly good night, you just want to share it with somebody and there's nobody. You go to your hotel bedroom and you can't sleep because your head is buzzing and the TV's all in a foreign language or whatever. You know, there are things like that. But is it all you've ever dreamt of when you were a child? I mean, has oh. it turned out the way you could have wanted? Yes, except it's a very, very difficult profession because there's such an awful lot of competition. I mean, I think that pianists are the, the greatest number of any instrumental players in the world. There are just thousands and millions of us all vying for the same venues, the same dates, the same orchestras. We all want to be up there at the top. And it's this element of competition that I think sometimes it's, it's a battle that you've, you've got to fight and it's not always very pleasant. So how important is it then to have a life away from the keyboard? Well, I think it's very, very important because music is about life and therefore I think we really should experience it. It's no good trying to shut yourself away, avoiding accidents, illness or whatever. What do you mean by that? How does life well, inform music exactly? Life is a reflection of music. It's the composer's emotion. It's their personal way of expressing themselves. And therefore, in order for us to interpret their music, we have got to put ourselves in the same situation. If someone is grief-stricken about something, I mean, this incredibly sad study of Chopin, it's amazing. I mean, it's one of the saddest things that I've ever played. And if we haven't been through such a wretched kind of sadness in our lives, how are we ever going to understand that and therefore interpret it. So, I mean, I'm not saying that we should all plunge ourselves into terrible despair or make bad things happen, but conversely, I think we have to live happy lives as well and feel free not just to have to shut ourselves up in studios and sometimes even do dangerous things. Because, I mean, I love horse riding, I love skiing, I love sport, I'm a good swimmer. I mean, certainly the skiing and the horse riding have been very, very dangerous. I've had bad accidents doing both things, which you might think is a little bit crazy. But at the same time, I enjoy myself so much, and it's a complete break from this world of just living with the piano day after day, yourself in your house, playing your own piano, rehearsing, and all the travelling and that kind of thing. Well, good for you. I do know of at least one performer who won't even wash his fingers for fear that he's going to do them damage. So good for you there. Well, look, you need to be fit to play mm. this second Chopin piece uh, of these two, uh, the F minor fantasy, mm. which is really regarded as one of the most difficult things mm. a Chopin pianist can possibly attempt. First of all, why this term fantasy? Is this something to do with our romantic movement again? Yes, I think it is. Uh, I mean, really, a fantasy is a sort of product of the imagination. And fantasy goes back a long, long way in Tudor times. I mean, people were writing fantasias, as they called them then, um, which were virtually sort of improvisations that could get written down. C.P. Bach, one of the sons of J.S. Bach, was another one who wrote fantasies and fantasias and things like that. Mozart, of course, wrote a couple um, where the themes just vary from one to another. So it is a kind of freedom 
that you're not necessarily bound to a certain structure that has a name like a sonata, a rondo, variations. So it does imply freedom that in a way you can improvise and then of course I mean it has to be organized to a certain extent as well. But it's back to this romantic idea yes. of being able to express feeling mm -hmm. and not having to be confined. That's right, now, yes. Now what is so difficult about this piece then? Um, it has some of the I think most sustained drama in one piece that Chopin ever wrote. I mean there really isn't too much respite. I mean we have Again, this lovely melody which dances, though in the end when it comes back, I mean I play it very, very strongly because the last section is, is really sort of very triumphant. Um, and it is that sustained drama that we move from one musical idea straight into another. And it, it's very, very powerful stuff. And also the structure, it's Chopin's longest single movement work, and he put it together so brilliantly. But at the same time, I think you've got to really watch your speed, how one thing moves into another, without feeling that it's actually disjointed, which is the, is the great danger that you could do with a piece with all these sections, which actually recur at certain stages in different keys. How different is the performance of a fantasy going to be each time around? Um, not terribly different, I don't think. I mean, yes. I've been playing this piece for a long time. I mean, it harks back to my teens and it is a wonderful piece in that it's a good long meaty piece you can put it at the end of a program you can put it at the end of a first half of a program and it's got a sensational ending um, in that it's a complete surprise but how often when you're in the middle of a performance do you suddenly decide you're going to do it completely differently to the way you've ever done it before does that happen to you not with this piece so much I mean it has happened with others it would depend how it's going, I think, um, the amount of accuracy that you're generating, let's say, because there are a lot of very, very dangerous moments in this piece, these octave spells that we have and, and certain other runs going up, um, I mean, that don't normally fail at all, but sometimes you can feel that you're really having a good night, the piano is superb, your hair's looking beautiful, the makeup's all gone fantastically and the audience is out there, brilliant, it's a big venue and you're really doing wonderfully. And then you can, I don't know, relax a little and sort of let fly. And that's when you feel, oh, I can really give this a go. I mean, if you were playing a crummy old piano that was really just not up to it, there was an audience of about 10, it was raining outside, you were tired at the end of a tour, that sort of thing can, can affect the performance as well, that it couldn't be well, quite Please give it a go just now, yes. just for us. <laughs> Thanks, Angela.
some pieces uh, feel a lot longer than they actually are. You live through them in the best possible way. And that was what, I don't know, 11 or 12 minutes. Yes, 12 it seems minutes, in a way a mm. lot longer because mm. you live through it. Mm. Wonderful, wonderful piece. Now, let's go back to the beginning again, shall we? To the little girl who climbed up onto the <laughs> piano stool at the age of two or mm. even a bit less possibly yeah. and picked out a few notes. Mm. And in a way, that's something you've been doing ever since mm. in your concerts. You love making up arrangements, improvising it, yes. if you like, yeah. uh, on the platform. Uh, does that mean in sort of any style? Not any style, but lots of different styles I could do. And obviously some lend themselves an awful lot better than others. Let's say Rachmaninoff, Mendelssohn, even Brahms. I've done Scriabin, I've done Metner. Liszt and Chopin, not Bach and not Mozart. Beethoven slow movements, perhaps, but, you know, these other styles, I mean, Bach and, and Mozart, are just, you know, very, very difficult. To so what do you do? Do people call out from the audience, you know, a name of Beatles numbers, and do you have to put them into, <laughs> into the style of Beethoven, or no. what? How does it work? Well, I mean, once I gave an all Metner concert, and so I improvised in the style of Metner at the end, and ditto with Scriabin. And if perhaps I've been playing, let's say, the F minor fantasy at the end of a programme, I might weave in a Gershwin song in the style of Chopin and then play the Gershwin song itself and of course people find it very amusing. It's very short. I don't do an awful lot but I mean we do have the, the, the melody sort of wound up in, in the Chopin style and what I do is I, I just plan the chords really. You've got to do something. I mean you can't sit in front of an audience with just absolutely nothing in your head at all. You can do that when you're at home and if it falls apart that's okay. You can learn by the experience but it will be very very silly I think to, to go out in front of an audience and just have no idea at all what you're going to do. Okay so you've got the, the bare bones of it, the, the chords, but I mean mm. just, just how do you improvise? I mean I, I just can't understand this as a, as a mm. like a a pub pianist myself, I can't understand what goes through the mind when you're improvising, because you've got to stay in the right key. Yes. Mm -hmm. You've always got to be watching that, but mm. you're trying to produce something that's different and original around mm. that. Mm. I mean, what, what goes through your mind? Well, it's all based on hearing something a millisecond before you play. Right. And so if, let's say, I mean, you were doing a straight improvisation, um, let's say, take the style of Mendelssohn, for instance, and perhaps try to make a song without words. I mean, let's try that. Um, well, I'll just literally do that now and see if I can think of something. Um... With something like that that's just come into my head. And it really had. This it is really not a set up job come. here. You not, chose Mendelssohn no. at that moment. Um, what I did was I chose a melody that I could remember the steps which it took and the cadence point like that. Because again, it can't just be random. You can't just go on making up tune after tune after tune. You've got to come back. And the, I mean, I make sometimes what I think are fairly wonderful improvisations at home. And then I think, what on earth did I start with? I just can't remember. I cannot remember. So if you're going to do something, if we were going to do a Beethoven slow movement, for instance, um, I did one the other day in the style of... based on the Appassionata slow movement. I can't um, believe you said that. It's true. <laughs> it's true. Um, and you could start, I mean, just like... And with little bit... Put in as well. Just, just for a little to, laugh. Just, because there's, there's a grand tradition of improvising. Mm. For example, in the organ world, I mean, mm. in France, mm. oh, for, yes. for decades, yeah. it's been one of the traditions mm. that, that mm. Uh, composers make up vast works yes. but it's and then so they get much, written down afterwards. Yeah, it's much, much easier on the organ. You can use pedal points, which are 
fantastic. I mean, you can go on for hours and just keep changing your pedal points. And it's just amazing. The piano is actually much, much more difficult. You're responsible, you know, for everything. You don't have those pedals to kind of help you. Um, so it's a pretty dangerous game, but I still think it's very, very exciting. And I wish, in a way, it still existed. I mean, there have been times that I have wanted to improvise cadenzas for Mozart concertos. And I mean, once a very eminent conductor said, oh no, he said, no, it's far too risky. I, I wouldn't know when we, when we could come in. But in the end, I'm afraid I did it. And he didn't speak to me afterwards. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, yeah. I made it very, very obvious where that last trill was. Mm. And he sort of took up the baton and everybody was getting ready and it was all right. Um, and I don't see, I mean, obviously there are a few people in the world who do do that kind of thing, but not very many. And I think it's very, very sad that, I mean, I've taught young people who were really budding virtuosos and they couldn't even play Happy Birthday to You or the National Anthem or Christmas Carols or anything like that. And here we've got this fantastic instrument that can do everything. It's like an orchestra. It's, it's wonderful. And somehow just can't exploit it. OK, you're going to improvise us on encore, what's it going to be? The very first things that this little fat baby of two or whatever heard, my parents only had two recordings. One was Rubinstein playing a, a Polonaise of Chopin and the other was two Gershwin songs, Love Walked In and Our Love Is Here To Stay. So they're going to be in that order. From the Goldwyn Follies, yes, I seem to remember, yes, the film yes. from uh, just pre-war. That's right, yeah. And, and obviously ones that George didn't arrange himself, Gershwin. Great. Mm. Thanks, Angela, very much indeed. Yeah.